Welcome again to the Sundays, the show that gives you tomorrow's news. Tonight, we're going to try to put together our own Sunday newspaper, what we think tonight are the best lead stories, sport, gossip, foreign politics, art, if we can fit them all in. Here are some of the stories our panel might choose from, they might like to discuss. Babs, I've found love of my life in the Sunday people. TV Shane caught cheating by wife in the news of the world. Queen Mother's papers destroyed Sunday Times. Keep out of France, Prince is told, Sunday Telegraph. Louise's mum and dad fight to save marriage, Sunday Mirror. Four-year-old racists to face court restraining orders, independent on Sunday. Tax war on the soccer thugs, the Express. Brown versus Beckett, round two in the Observer. And with me to put together our Sunday are Larry Turner, presenter of BBC Two's Looking Good and writer of the Evening Standard. Jane Thin, author and journalist, Francis Ween, private eye veteran and award-winning columnist with The Guardian, and Peter Hitchens, columnist with The Express, and we'll be going live to Will Hutton, editor of The Observer. <laughs> OK, we're going to start with... Uh... Start with what this panel thinks is the most important story that the British public should be reading about tomorrow morning. Francis Ween, what's that? Well, I have a slight problem here, Melvin, because I didn't think any of those lead stories was terrifically interesting or exciting. Uh, the Sunday Times fills most of its front page with, as you say, Queen Mother's papers destroyed. But when you read the story, all it turns out to mean is that a few of her letters to Norman St. John Stevens have been thrown in the bin by Princess Margaret. It's not exactly <laughs> the most scintillating thing of all time. Whereas buried on page, page five is what I think should have been the lead story, uh, a thing headed, Police Figures Hide Poor Clear-Up Rate. Um, and it's all about how police forces, who already have pretty poor uh, figures for clearing up crimes, um, turn out to be falsifying the figures. And the Audit Commission, which is now in charge of these things, has forced them to produce, uh, to collate their statistics in a new way. Because in the olden days, for example, they'd classify multiple burglaries um, in an entire block of flats in one day as one crime, or um, exclude common assaults when people aren't seriously injured from the figures for violent crime. And um, this means that, for example, whereas under the old figures, uh, the massage figures, Leicestershire's force admitted to solving just 8% of its burglaries, bad enough, you'd think, under the new figures, they'll show detection rates as low as 6%. Um, and it's full of statistics, this story, absolutely riveting ones to me. In Surrey, the number of crimes solved per officer each year is 55 and that's under the old statistics. Uh, each officer in Surrey manages to solve five and a half crimes a year, but under the new statistics, the real detection rate will be lower. It's very dismay. And it's I very... think that the Sunday Times is probably frightened of this because it has so many figures in it, this story. Um, but it seems to me also it's something that affects most people in this country. I mean, most people have been burgled or know lots of people who have been um, and have not had it cleared up and often wonder what happens about all these crimes. And I should have thought the Sunday Times, I mean, just in journalistic terms, would have made rather more of this story. What do you think of this story, Larry? Well, funny, 5.5 a year. What on earth are they doing the rest of the time? They're I'm around in helicopters. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> presumably, or polishing their uniforms. No, I mean, you know, we, we are accustomed to being encouraged, we say, to say, our boys in blue, best in the world, you know, great job, lads. And then when you hear figures like that, 5.5 a year, I'm sorry, are they in the canteen for mm. half the day, you know? Jane? It's a classic Sunday... T Sunday newspaper story in that it's full of those statistics that completely befuddle you, particularly first thing on a Sunday morning. And, you know, 5.5 crimes, 6% of, of, of all crimes are violent crime. I mean, it's hard to keep them in your brain, you know. I simply don't either... I certainly wouldn't put that on the front page of, of a newspaper. The Peter, fact that only 6% of burglaries are ever sold. You don't think people can take I that in? I don't know if I even trust the statistics, I did, actually. I, I did love the idea of, of being so important that you had to have Princess Margaret to come around and clear up your rubbish. <laughs> 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 does, she come, does she come on a dust cart swinging off the end of it? <laughs> but no, I think Francis is, 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 is right. The, 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 what's happening to our police force is quite bizarre at the moment. There are so many of them and they spend so much money, and yet you never see any of them anywhere. They're all in some chamber somewhere, staring at computer screens and controlling helicopters. And these figures are devastating, but no one will admit to them because no one's prepared to change the culture of the police, which, is, which, is, which has been, in my view, over-influenced by television. 
in the past 20 years. They've been really? watching too well, much. Well, if they've been influenced by Dixon and Doc Green, they'd have done OK. So there's more uh, they, influence they, no, than no one's heard of Dixon and Doc Green anymore. I bet yeah. you a lot of people in this audience have never even heard of Dixon. Have, has yeah. you heard of Dixon? Yeah. This shows, how in, this shows how in touch our uh, panelists, Mr uh, Hitchens, is this a mere introduction to his cutting-edge uh, comments. Blue lamp. Jane Thin, your, your main story. Well, I'm afraid this story is much derided by my fellow panelists, but I think it is the lead story of the week, which is the Mail on Sunday's £10 a week car tax in cities, which is the news that if John Prescott has his way in a white paper next month, um, we're going to be paying £10 every time we go into one of our major cities and take our car in for a shopping trip. Is that a suggestion? You talked about being befuddled earlier. I'm befuddled as to whether that's a suggestion, a proposition, an expectation, or a lot. What status does it have? According to, obviously, an authoritative leak in the Mail on Sunday, it is definitely happening in the white paper this summer. And <laughs> <laughs> it's what, I mean... It's Anybody all, else? Obviously, it's something that's being floated at the moment to see what the reaction is, and um, £500 a year may or may not be the figure we end up. With, but I think it is very serious that they're going to do something about the amount, the amount of traffic going into town. They've said it several times, and it's obviously going to happen. If only they would, but ask yourself this question Has this story been floated by a friend of John Prescott or an enemy of John Prescott? <laughs> <laughs> I reckon it's the latter. Anything from Francis? Larry? I think it's a brilliant idea if they would bring it in. I mean, I don't drive, and all I do is breathe oh. in the fumes. <laughs> <laughs> I can drive, I don't choose to have a car. It's because I don't need one. Story, though. It's, I mean, this has been floated. I mean, even when Labour was in opposition, uh, new Labour think tanks would come out with this from time to time. I remember a thing called the Institute for Public Policy Research suggesting this years ago, when Blair was um, still Shadow Home Secretary or something. And so it's not a very new proposal. And uh, as uh, you say, it's not um, hard policy yet. I mean, I sort of feel that it has that um, sort of vague, timeless quality of so many Sunday newspaper splashes. Right, Peter Hitchens. Peter Hitchens, Hitchens, you have a different story again. Yes, I do. I, it, this is a real man bites dog story. It's Church of England takes moral stand. <laughs> and, and it is so astonishing to me that such a thing should be happening that I, I think it deserves its I place. I think the on, Church on the of England of, is, could be classified as an easy target. Front of the, <laughs> on the front of the Sunday Telegraph, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who I, I discovered from here is called Dr George Kerry, has personally <laughs> objected to Tony Blair about moves back by the Prime Minister to, to lower the legal age of consent for homosexual relations to 16. Now, it is, uh, I think, a, a good choice of story because I have a feeling that this debate on Monday will dominate the whole week. And of the stories floating around, it is the one which strikes me as the one which will become the major, the major talking point. And for that reason, is a, is a sharp choice. It's care also, what it is. The Church of England thinks well, on since, this, nobody, I don't. since nobody else, yeah. since nobody else in, in the government or the opposition a, appears to be objecting to this anymore, uh, they're, they're going to have to resort to caring. To, about what George Kerry says. At least he has actually said something which a lot of people think, but very few politicians now have the courage to say. Do you think that's true, Francis? Do you think a lot of people think but a lot of co politicians have the courage to say? Or do politicians think that if, if people can fight for their country at 16, they can uh, do what they want sexually in private at 16? I don't, I, I don't think Peter's quite right. I think it is true there are one or two politicians on the Labour side who may be afraid to say it. I mean, certainly last time round, when Labour was in opposition, uh, David Blunkett and I think Anne Taylor both voted against lowering the age of consent and now it looks as if they will um, troop loyally into the lobby. So maybe there are one or two people like that who would rather vote against it but will go through. But uh, it's only a tiny number, I think, on the whole. Most people will, in Parliament will vote for it because they actually believe in equality of age of consent. Larry Turner. I think they vote for it because they're, they're, they're afraid of, of fashionable opinion. Larry Turner, your story. <laughs> Well, somebody who's never afraid of being unfashionable, aren't you? Well, I, I would, you know, I think if we're having to go, go down to the dregs of the uh, Church of England to try and oppose this uh, uh, probable new law, then it shows you how much times have changed and that the vast majority of British people are behind this, and it will go through. Your story, Larry. Yes, I've um, really sunk to new depths. This is, on one sense, you could say it's a gossip story, but actually it is the story, in my view, that everybody will be talking about tomorrow. It's on the front of the Sunday Mirror. Louise's mum and dad fight to save marriage. According to the Sunday Mirror, and it's, it has been picked up elsewhere, um, Louise's father um, has a, in quotes, girlfriend. He, they say that he had the girlfriend before Louise went to America and that once everything got rather difficult over Louise and the baby, they kept it all quiet and they presented this united front. Uh, but now, within days, according to the Sunday Mirror, they will announce that they are to separate and they will divorce. Well, we followed up on this. We had a long conversation with Jean Jones' husband, who is the source of this story, and he said that in both articles, the uh, Mirror and the News of the World, 
he was taken out of context. And that, well, uh, did he or did he not say? There is a quote that says, everybody knows he, as in Luisa's father, has a girlfriend. That quote does appear. I've done my own bit of digging on this as well, and I would have to say that my sources tend to support this story. Right. I think, it, I think uh, as speaking as a woman, when I watched that press conference, I wasn't really listening to what she was saying. I was looking at the body language between all of them. And the, I thought the body language between the mother and father was very peculiar. They didn't catch each other's eye. They, they studiously avoided each other's gaze. And I thought, something's up there. I don't know what it is. And so I'm not surprised by this. I Francis Wynne, and then Joan. Well, my only quibble is that I think you've got the wrong paper. I think the News of the World version is much better. Um, news of the World <laughs> is a dab hand at this sort of story. It's a perfect News of the World story. And um, they understand there are certain rules that have to be obeyed. You have to have the words secret trysts in the main headline. So they say, <laughs> tears as Louise's dad confesses secret trysts. And there's an even better subhead. Uh, which is just a multiple pile-up of nouns. Killer case love sham explode, exposed. <laughs> and it, in the very first, I think, paragraph, it has him steamy, sneaking off for steamy sex sessions. I mean, you know, they just know how to do these things in the news of the world. If you're going to have steamy sex well, sessions... Well, let's select the story. Which, shams, which story would we go with as our main story? The crime clear-up rates, the tax incentives, the warning on gay sex, or Louis's mum, Louise's mum and dad? Nobody's going to give away. I have been converted to gay sex because I think I think you're probably. <laughs> 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 I, think, I think Peter's right. In I know her husband very well. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be running all week. It's going to, there's going to be well, thoughts for days all over the place. Story about this. Was there a story, Francis? Well, I have to stick by my story, but. Yes. Um, uh, well, I agree with Peter that I, there will I be a certain amount of gay sex. Think? Do you think gay sex or, or the crime? Gay sex. Crime? Crime. Crime. crime? Well, it's very nice to have you both in voting for both stories. This, is a, <laughs> this proves that this is an absolutely, totally unrepresentative audience. Uh, now, I think I'm going to, as I'm supposed to be this ridiculous sort of mock editor figure, I think we're gonna, I'm going to put crime up as my story. We'll go to Will Hutton, the editor of the Observer. What do you think is the big story, Will? <laughs> I think the big story is the one we splashed with, actually, about <laughs> Brown and Beckett um, scrapping over the future of the post office. Um, but and I don't think, although gay sex at first sight looks a good story, I mean, the vote tomorrow, uh, uh, on Monday, now, uh, it's not tomorrow, is it? It's still, it's still not yet quite Sunday, on Monday, um, is going to go so decisively in favour of lowering the age of consent, both William Hager's behind and Tony Barrow behind it, there'll be a huge uh, majority in favour in the Commons that what they do in the Lords won't really influence. So I think the story will die by Tuesday and Wednesday, is my view. What about this uh, story that you've got, the Brown versus Beckett? I mean, three out of four weeks you've had Brown on the front page of the Observer, Will. <laughs> and, and you've had two out of four weeks you've had Brown versus Beckett on the front page of the Observer, Will. Uh, perhaps this could be explained. Well, I think that the, I mean, there's a, what's happening is, is uh, fundamental to the future of the government. What's happening is this uh, uh, Margaret Beckett is raising her standard as the defender of inverted commas, um, old labour values, whether it be the minimum wage, whether it be union recognition, and now the future of the post office. And uh, Brown is having to go for her. I think it's the, and I think it's the, dr the political drama at the centre of the government. Isn't this anything more than departments fighting the chance to get more money, or to, is, which, which happens all the time, every year, whenever the, the no, government... Is, no, I think this, this thing about the post office is the big one. I mean, the, the Tories weren't able to privatise the post office. Remember, all, remember the huge rows about that. The Daily Mail ran a big campaign saying, uh, you know, save our post office. And uh, Margaret Beckett feels very strongly that Labour should be defending the idea of public enterprise and it shouldn't be in the business of privatising. I don't know whether anybody else wants to ask you one thing, but I'd like to ask you one thing. You're, uh, you're very much an economics burden. We, we, um, the uh, state we're in, your best-selling book and so on. I can't understand when Japan's supposed to be collapsing, when on the front of the Sunday business, the Americans and Germany are trying to blitz London Stock Exchange and take over London's position in Europe, you're, you're, you are not dealing with those rather more important stories than a sort of feud that you have seen for four weeks happening around Gordon Brown. Well, um, there's a whole page inside the main news section, there's a double page spread in the business section, there's my column on all that, plus we carry the news story inside. So, you know, I think if you, <laughs> if you look at us compared with all the other broadsheets, we do the most on it. Right. And as for the story that Sunday Business uh, splashed with, it's a bit speculative, and I really don't know whether um, the, that's the right interpretation of the, uh, what was, after all, a meeting of officials in Tokyo uh, earlier today. But, uh, I mean, it is the big story, but you can't keep saying the same thing week in, week out. You have to report the news. Right. Anybody else? No. Well, we'll back to you very soon. Well, thank you very much. We're, uh, what are we going to do now? We're going to look at a few cartoons while we get ready for the gossip section. Uh, the Sunday Times, as Nick Newman's caption with the bloke with the big hat, says, uh, Gerald's on Viagra. 
I knew I wouldn't get away with that. <laughs> uh, the Sunday Times again, Gerald Scarf. He's, uh, the caption says, a birthday wish on this your day, get your act together or fade away. <laughs> the Sunday Telegraph has got Trog with Kenneth Clark whopping uh, poor old Haig again. And the Observer has Riddle, and the caption says, Tony Blair, three pounds an hour, kid, take it or leave it. I think that was a perfect impersonation um, or impression. Um, now then, we talk about gossip. Larry Turner, what's your main gossip story? Well, having selected a story for my least story that was quite gossipy, this is even more gossipy. It's about uh, Cher. It's also in the Sunday Bureau. Now, um, it's in the Confidentially Speaking, Chris Hutchins' sort of showbiz gossip column. And it concerns um, Cher's recent visit to uh, the grave of her dead ex-husband, uh, Sonny. And now, bearing in mind that, of course, they had a somewhat stormy marriage, and then they, uh, when they broke up, it wasn't too good. Um, then she now says, that, though, that she's been to the grave, and she's rather sad that it's a, it's a bit dull, and it lacks the fun and excitement that uh, he brought to life. And therefore, she wants to change the gravestone for a pinball machine. <laughs> she said, Sonny would dig it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, only in America. I don't know whether it's true. I don't care if it's true. I think it's a fantastic story. I and mean, I don't think it should be. A, it shouldn't be a pinball machine. One of those organs that used to come up from underneath <laughs> in, a, in old cinema. It'd come up from the grave, couldn't it? Mighty playing Wallace Sonny and Cher. The mighty Wallace. Sonny comes up playing the organ <laughs> from the grave. Yeah. Francis Ween, you're uh, you're you're worried about wine. Yes, Melvin. Mine comes from uh, the Sunday Express, or the Express on Sunday, I think it calls itself these days. And it's about Lord Irvin, the Lord Chancellor, who um, I think is known to like a drink or two. And he was visiting Hillsborough Castle, the official residence of Mo Molum, fancied a drink after a long day. And the butler poured him a glass of 1985 Rioja Gran Reserva. And Lord Irvin liked it so much, he had to have some for his cellar. But Hillsborough had only six cases left, which were the last ones available. The vintage had run out. So Derry Irvin had the six cases returned to the supplier in Belfast so he could buy them back from them and have them sent to his home in Argyle. The wine was intended for Mo Molum's table, explained the source. But when Derry's fancy is tickled, it's very difficult to dissuade him, as art galleries all over the land know <laughs> to their cost. Um, and this only came to light when a couple of other Labour MPs were visiting Hillsborough, and one of them rather liked this Rioja, and said, could we have a bottle of that, please? And um, when they asked for it, they were told Lord Irvin had commandeered the entire s year's supply on his recent visit. So hats off to Lord Irvin. Yeah, He's cleaned Mo Molum out of all her nice Rioja. Yes, he bought it, though, Great didn't man, he? Though. he didn't well, he uh, bought it, he bought yes. It, yeah. Wasn't it cheap, though? Yeah. Only ten quid a bottle. He got it very cheap. Yes, it wasn't champagne, as in champagne socialist, I suppose. No, he's not a champagne, he's more of a whiskey socialist, isn't Peter he? Peter Hitchens, your gossip. Well, th this story would be about a fat cat, except that he's a Labour supporter, so he's a, a thin cat. Uh, it's from the Express on Sunday, which is indeed what it's called, Francis, and it's about um, somebody called Gavin Davis, who you may have heard of this week because he stands to have a bonus of, uh, depending on which account you read, £45 million or £60 million or £100 million for working so incredibly hard uh, for a merchant bank. And uh, Mr. Davis is married to Sue Nye, who's Gordon Brown's political secretary, and is therefore completely and utterly unconnected with the, uh, with the Labour government and its, uh, and, and its elite. And therefore, <coughs> that can't explain why nobody anywhere in the Labour Party is raising any concerns about him. And here is a beautiful picture of his uh, stunning modern house, with the poetic name Baggy House, uh, on the coast of Devon, uh, where he lives, and which has gone up in value since Labour came to power, by £180,000, which is probably more than most Labour supporters value their own houses. Uh, just a little instance of, uh, of uh, what uh, New Britain is like. You do, you do feel that Captain Davis, like Derry Irvin, is going to run and run. He's one of those Labour figures that's just going to provide endless stories. I mean, is it not the case that actually he's going to make about £45 million after the Whoa. Goldman Sachs well, we don't, we don't really know how much it's going to be, but it's certainly going to be an awful lot more than any of us is. I just thought, when I saw the picture of that house, I thought, well, if you compare it to Debbie, Derry Irvin's wallpaper, which was quite revolting, here's a man who's got real taste. That house is fantastic. <laughs> if they draft him in to do the, all the official residence for all the uh, members of the Cabinet... I don't know whether the, the by insinuation insinuating something about Goldman Sachs's relation to the Labour Party, Peter. No, I mean, I the just, fact is Goldman just, Sachs is an international firm no, that's I'm sort of putting itself on the market. Insinuate nothing. I'm just saying this is... Insinuating that, this that um, Labour has a lot of very rich supporters. Yes, um, I think, I think this is because the only, only, only socialists can afford to support Labour because they're the only ones who can afford to pay the taxes. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
I think uh, I think I'm on a bound to let you get away with that, Peter. That, 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 I'm, I'm not going to say nothing about that load of rubbish at all. Jane, all right. <laughs> Your this is another story about um, somebody very rich with a big house who I don't think is a Labour supporter, which is um, Earl Spencer. And it's... One does feel... I mean, it's a big week for Earl Spencer. He's doing a documentary, and you do feel tremendously sorry for him. But at the same time, he's one of these people who keeps ruining his own life. And in um, the Sunday Mirror, I think it is, or People Mirror, we have a big thing about um, his uh, latest um, sexual... Um, well... Um, it, it, <laughs> problem. Um, get it out, Jane. Get it out. <laughs> he was two timing. As far as I can see, he's two or three timing somebody called Josie, according to this piece. Um, and it's got some wonderful, and uh, you just can't help reading the, the pieces about uh, the evening he meets Bonnie. There was definitely a lot of sexual tension there. It was like watching a male rhino in a courting ritual. You could <laughs> smell his pheromones in the air. He's a beast. And um, I do think. I, this piece is written by somebody called Graham Johnson, and I do think with the demise of Catherine Cookson, there's definitely a place for somebody writing about <laughs> the top with the kind of heart of steel. It, further on, they've, gone, they've actually made it to the bedroom, and um, there was a dark silence. Bonnie was afraid to say anything. She felt the Earl was angry. Um, nothing happens, <laughs> as you can guess, and uh, he doesn't return her call, but it's all written in this fantastically heightened aristocratic... Aristocrat meets... Um, Meets girl below, below stairs. Right now, which is our main gossip Sorry. story then? Which is our, is it? Are we going to talk about Cher's jukebox or this this chap, uh, this Goldman Sachs fellow, uh, or Earl Spencer, or Derry and the Wine? None you're giving. Well, one? I'm staying faithful to the Earl. I faithful think. Faithful to the Earl. No, no, I think Derry Irvin has to be top because no? he's such a wonderful. You're not I'm sticking with Baggy you're sticking House. You're sticking with... <laughs> well, I don't know. Anybody got any suggestions out there? Jukebox. We think. We think, that, we think the jukebox, like, when Cher's munching Sonnet to have a jukebox to uh, mark his grave, or an organ coming up, we, and yes, yes, never mind, an organ coming out of the grave. That ends the gossip section, and that's the story, and we will be back after the break. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome back. The lead story uh, is the crime rate story, the statistics which show that uh, crime seems to be increasing and catching people seems to be going down. And the gossip is about Cher wanting a different sort of gravestone, perhaps in the shape of a pin table or a jukebox, for Sonny. And now we come to the uh, political stories, starting with Peter Hitchens. Well, as you probably know, Melvin, I never had a honeymoon with Tony Blair. And I've been, <laughs> I've been worried about all the rest of you who seem to have been having one, and I've been looking, hopefully, for signs that it is over, and I have found one on page 9, or is it page 6, I'm reading upside down, of The Observer. Here it is. It's very big. And uh, what it says, because The Observer isn't a Labour-supporting newspaper, so that's not the explanation of that. What it says is that Tony Blair's great project to build a mass membership party of more than half a million members has gone into reverse. In fact, the Labour Party membership is falling, and most of those leaving are the new members. And it seems to me that this is the first cuckoo of summer, that at last people are beginning to realise that the whole thing, welcomed, of course, by Will Hutton as a new dawn equivalent to the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, and the American Declaration of Independence, rolled into one with Christmas, uh, wasn't quite as exciting. <laughs> wasn't quite as exciting as we were being led to believe, and especially those most closely involved and those most enthusiastic are losing at, steam. Before you start frothing at the mouth, And I think the fact the this mouth, is on Peter. page six of The Observer, and that big, is interesting. You are, but yeah, bef yes. Um, yes, you are having a good time, though, aren't you? I mean, a few... Uh, <laughs> uh, a year later... A year after the election, a few of the new members sort of have dropped back. That's all that's happened. It isn't, it isn't, it isn't all that massive. But as long as it pleases you, that's absolutely fine. Has anybody <laughs> any comments to make on this? Uh, a lot of wishful thinking there. I mean, inevitably, people stop belonging to a party once the election's over and they don't want to kind of... But we'll go they to start getting irritated. I mean, stands to reason. Will Hutton is rocking in his seat like some demented <laughs> Father Christmas. Will, what do you think of this? Attack, a savage <laughs> well, attack by Hitchens. He doesn't it, know I, which I, page I like it's this, on. I like the description of... I like Peter's description of, uh, you know, the kind of hyperbole with which, with which the Observer allegedly... Um, 
uh, greeted the arrival of New Labour, and uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> you had the great headline, <laughs> farewell <laughs> xenophobia. Uh, yeah, and then going on to remind everybody that actually uh, we have had some distances between the Labour Party and uh, some spats over the last year. I'll come back. But I mean, the story, the story stands. The, uh, I mean, the story stands. Uh, the uh, Labour Party membership is falling. Uh, the party is concerned. The figures may be actually worse um, than, um, than that. And, of course, Mo Molan's party political broadcast recently was devoted entirely to wooing new members. So I think there is yeah. a story there. Yes. Yeah. Well, fair enough. Jane Thin, your story. Oh, I've got the YAY spin doctors. Yet another spin doctor um, has appeared this week, and this time it's um, spin doctor for the People's Monarch, the new um, Queen spin doctor who's being paid either 190,000 or 230,000, according to which newspaper you choose, and who's started this rather um, enticing career by getting some terribly bad PR of his own, including from a Conservative MP. Talking of this man, Simon Lewis, he's stiff, humourless, over-promoted and charmless. His salary puts a high price on the value of PR and far too low a price on the monarchy itself. And rather dismally, I mean, it does make your heart sink, um, he's going to um, see the Royal Family PLC like any other blue-chip company, according to the Mail on Sunday. He wants to ex engage expensive consultants who would research the boss's image and come up with a repackaging proposal. Just well, the idea the of... Family, oh, then, it? <laughs> it really is. I mean, he also lives in Islington, but it's at pains to stress that he doesn't support New Labour, which is... And he's a friend is, of uh, Sherry, and he's a friend of Mandelson. But, as you say, I mean, Labour, you'd think, would be rather pleased having their person in Number 10, friend of New Labour, living in Islington, and all the rest of it. But they've been desperate to distance themselves. I noticed in one or two of the stories about this chap, uh, Labour said, no, 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 as far as we know, he's a Liberal Democrat. <laughs> so even they obviously realise um, that uh, this could backfire on them very badly. If the, because the moment the role's going to be bad publicity, Labour will be... Um, As if to make up it's not going to the, to, the, to the Observer for a lead story, the you, there's the two Mother. stories about, uh, from the Observer and politics. You went to the Observer for the Brown versus Blair uh, uh, argument or whatever's going on there. Yes, well, um, this does, doesn't quite tally with Peter's claim that the Observer has nothing to the discredit of New Labour because they filled most of a page with a, an article by Andrew Marr, their political commentator, one of their thousands of political commentators, uh, headed the Neighbours from Hell, all about um, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, illustrated rather libelously with a photo of Tony Blair holding his arm up in his shirt sleeves and underneath there's a mass of sweat. It's the most disgusting picture. Right? <laughs> anyway, um, not fit for Sunday breakfast tables, I think. But the gist of the story um, takes off from their front page thing about Brown versus Beckett, and this is about Brown versus Blair, which has been a running story throughout this government. Uh, you remember the Gordon Brown semi-authorised biography and all these other fallings out. And... Ma attempts to get to the bottom, bottom of this because it is actually a very important thing in the government. This that, is the problem that for the Brown all, Labour, all Labour supporting newspapers. Which Labour party exactly. are they supporting? The Brownites and the Blairites are at loggerheads. And um, mm. everyone, could has, it, could everyone now has to decide in the government are you, are you a Brownite or are you a Blairite? And best could you thing be of all exaggerating is, on this, Francis? No. Well, no. well, well, the, this well the odd thing about this piece is that even Andrew Ma, who's a very brilliant political commentator, can't quite explain what's at the bottom of it all. Uh, he says it's not really ideological as such, in that I mean, Brown has just seen off Margaret Beckett in the middle of the and it's not really this, it's not really that. Let but he says whatever it is, it's very important because it's, um, it's uh, spoiling the government and um, people not spend. What's it spoiling? Doing Brown brought out it's, it's an example of spend broad all their time broad worrying about this and not getting all newspapers who, but on the whole, don't cover the, the soap star. On the whole, don't cover the soap star sexual peccadilloes. But they love. They want to get their fix of gossip and intrigue, and therefore all they do is they simply transfer it to politics. Yes. Therefore, you have. In fact, it's exactly, exactly right. the same it's kind also, of story. It's more also high a, a, politics. Hold on, let Jane think of it. Yes, because politics is a personality, and it is. It is slightly disturbing to think that the only way we can make politics palatable now, as with Derry Irvin, as with Brown and Blair and Margaret Beckett, is to see it entirely in terms of yeah. feuds. I mean, it, it probably is the truth. Before I go, before I go, before I go to Will Hutton, I want the completely unbiased view of Peter Hitchens in this. Can I just draw your attention? Peter Hitchens, I must have Peter Hitchens. I've got, we've got to have a sober, objective comment. I don't have I don't have a completely <laughs> unbiased view or anything. But what you can have is, it, you, this is, the, the, you could have a soap opera called South West Enders about what goes on in Downing Street. But it would oh God, actually... You've started writing it, it, it would you? actually, yes. It would actually be true in this case, because what's at the basis of this is, is a personal rivalry between two people who both want to be Prime Minister and only one of them well, can Well, everybody be. throws this around. Will Hutton, do you believe that? I Do you really believe it? You know them both. Is there a personal rivalry, in your view, and what real evidence have you have, a personal rivalry going on between Gordon Brown and Tony Blair? I think there's a, a difference about what, where they want to get to. Well, that's, it, that's I, one thing. That's policy, isn't it? 
Um, We're talking uh, personal think, rivalry. We're talking soap opera. Good point, man. Well, you, know you know them well too, Melvin. I think that I think that I think that Gordon Brown wants to um, modernise the, the, the Labour Party to do kind of Labourish things, and uh, Tony Blair is more ambitious. I mean, he wants to pull the Liberal Democrats in, as Andrew Marr says in his piece. He but wouldn't, he, wouldn't, he, wouldn't be, he wouldn't be indifferent. The question having... is, the question is a good question, Will, and you're not answering it. No, and the question is, is the, uh, what basis have you got for this allegation of... Per they have policy differences, they may well do... Fine, although they seem to agree over the budget quite happily. Never mind. What basis is there for you saying that there's personal rivalry between these two and hammering away at it all the time? I'd just like to know. Well, I mean, Andrew Marr has argued this. He's spoken, in in, he's spoken to at least six cabinet ministers in researching that piece, and that is his considered judgment, and he's no mean political commentator, no, as commentator. you yourself said. And what the piece says is that uh, there are arguments about constitutional reform, about portrait representation, about where the Labour Party is going to be in 10 years' time, about what its relationship should be to social democracy, which yeah. actually do divide these two men. Well, does that um, make it personal? That's another matter. We'll... we'll, we'll Okay. I, don't, I still don't think you've got round to it. It's, it's, Last small it's, word. Francis. I mean, of course, it is soap, soap opera on one level, but uh, these soap operas can turn nasty because in Andrew Marr's piece, he quotes Margaret Thatcher as saying privately about Brown and Blair, theirs is a doomed relationship. Margaret well, Thatcher's know, now with a world authority on the well, Labour Party. Well, she's the world authority on this because, <laughs> Melvin, if you recall, when she fell out with Nigel Lawson and Geoffrey Howe, that was the end of her. Mm. It does matter. It made these things some end in tears. I, I, I do think you're a found. terrific journalist, Francis, but to call in Margaret Thatcher on the inner workings of well, the Well, she knows all about governments falling to bits. Poor old thing. She was booted out by her own party. <laughs> 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 OK, we've got to choose, we've got to choose our, 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 our political story here. It looks as if it's one of the Observer stories. Uh, Na fail I think the new members is the, the name. Neighbours from Hell, is that the strong story? It's, that's, it'll have yeah. to be the Neighbours from Hell, all right? All right, all right. While you're lining up for Lifestyle, I'm going to read a few of the arts reviews. Just a few from one or two papers. The Sunday Times has got a list of summer reading from Ralph Fiennes, Fiona Jenkins, David Hockney and Peter Mandelson. They say what they're going to read in their holidays. In The Independent on Sunday, it's... Um, Bemuse Reviewer doesn't see the point of performing Oedipus Tyrannus in the dark. In the Sunday Telegraph, we've been here before, the row over the Millennium Dome is nothing compared with the row over the Great Exhibition in 1851. The Mail on Sunday talks about the murderer who always kept his word. The Surgeon of Crowthorne is a book about an institutionalised murderer who is an unpaid contributor to the Oxford English Dictionary. In the Observer, Angels in Dirty Mac, City of Angels starring Meg Ryan and Nicolas Cage is an extended cinematic pun on Los Angeles itself. So you'll have to read more in the Observer to find out what that is about. Lifestyle, we're going to start here with Jane Thin. Well, uh, I, I'm reminded of um, Richard Littlejohn last week having a good laugh, um, rather tragically, at old age pensioners being ejected from their um, wheelchairs. This is another sad pensioner story. I don't know whether it's um, some awful trend taking over in the silly season, but um, this is about... Um, it's in the mirror and the observer. It is. Um, yeah. but very sad, right? Old age people who are being put into homes and they're not allowed to keep pets, cats or dogs, so they're being given Tamagotchis, the um, <laughs> computer pets. And um, it's so tragic. It says they will have to care for their virtual pet, give it a balanced diet of meals and snacks and give it regular exercise, said the uh, spokeswoman. I, I just think it's such an awful picture. But um, on the absolute other end of the scale, if they happen to be very, very rich OAPs, um, they can now get their pet cloned should their pet be on the way out and that they miss their moggy they can get it cloned um from a las vegas based firm clone aid but it's going to cost them seventy-five thousand pounds to do it so uh, <laughs> francis ween can you beat that with your lifestyle story well this is lifestyle insofar as the word has any meaning at all it's in the independent on sunday uh story headed new age managers turn to poetry and it's about the industrial society, a rather sort of boring and venerable and worthy body founded 80 years ago to improve health and safety at work and provide canteens and factories and so forth. And it's now gone all jazzy and new agey. Um, and last week it took half a dozen top executives from British companies to a remote Welsh farmstead for a leadership retreat lasting four days. Cost of £3,000 per person. There were exercises and awareness called Letting the Forest Find You. Sessions on haiku poetry and learning about gifting yourself a future. 
Those on the Welsh retreat, these six captains of industry, experienced communal cookings and housework to help them bind as a group. I mean, they could come and do that for me for far less than 3,000 quid. <laughs> uh, and to access the non-logical parts of themselves, they had to bring a piece of music and a favourite poem. Their goals, self-discovery, self-knowledge and improved leadership qualities. Sounds this... like one of those awful weekends with William Hague that you have to have. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but this is what, this is what um, leading business people are now doing, apparently. Right. Larry Turner. An exciting new area. Larry Turner. <laughs> Um, I've ch chosen something from uh, the Sunday Times Star section, of course, a section which is dedicated to those, those in and out lists, which, of course, you read one week, something's in, the next week it's out, and it's all dreadfully worrying. Well, they're, they're doing a whole piece on flowers. Um, funny that tomorrow is Father's Day, so if anybody's thinking of buying their father flowers, what you shouldn't buy, apparently, is chrysanthemums or carnations, both very out, very, very out. Also, twigs on their way out, in case you're thinking about giving them a bunch of twigs. <laughs> um, and tropical flowers. You're meant to buy roses, but the old-fashioned varieties are not the long-stemmed ones. The ones... Nick them for somebody's garden, I think, is, is the best one for that. Um, and anything in pastel colours. There you go. Well, there's a few tips. We'll be uh, better <laughs> off now Can I have a tiny lifestyle extra one? You forgot to mention Fionn Jenkins in your list of people who've offered their summer reading. I, I always find her, it difficult to pronounce, really. Her choice, <laughs> her choice is, um, is the new novel by Nick Hornby called About a Boy. I wonder who could, she could have in mind. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Hitchens, your life. I just feel it's terribly unoriginal. I, I've chosen the same, same one as Jane. And, and I was actually... I thought this wasn't a funny story, but a desperately sad one. The, the trouble with our society is that the people who are really neglected in it and who are dumped and who are the, the, the truly marginalised are the old. There is a very sad quotation from the story from, would you believe, a psychotherapist. It doesn't sound as though this will be very soothing for the pensioners, said Catherine Carroll, a psychotherapist, who counsels the elderly. They will be afraid of them dying. Right. Isn't that sad? Can you get any sadder than that? I think it's awful. Oh, well, we won't, we won't choose that one if it's that awful. I think we'll choose the uh, New Age Managers Turning to Poetry as our, uh, as our lifestyle. And we'll... Oh, come on, this is much more. You think it? Yeah. It is. One I of those three. It's interesting with what life is really like these days. Yeah. Well, two of you chose it. Okay, I'll have the pets. I don't think uh, many of them are actually... Right, we'll do the pets as our lifestyle story, and we will be back yeah. after the break. Welcome back, and let's look at our uh, board so far. The lead story is on the crime rates, the gossip is sure, the politics is Brown versus Blair, and the lifestyle is pet lovers. And we're going to go now to sport, briskly, Francis Wynne. Uh, well, Melvin, on Sunday night, there is this great football match between America and Iran. This is just a taster for the American game on Thursday against uh, Slobodan Milosevic's Yugoslavia. Um, it is war by other means, and um, the Sunday Telegraph has a piece from America and a piece from Tehran uh, the one from America suggesting that Clinton wants to use this football game to mend relations with Iran. Though since the American tabloids are headlining it, it's war. This doesn't sound very likely. <laughs> um, and in Iran, they're absolutely terrified, the authorities, because whatever happens, it's going to be awkward. Because if, if Iran loses, they've been beaten by the great Satan. But if they win, huge crowds will take to the streets. And this is a very worrying security problem, because the mullahs don't like that sort of thing, apparently. And equally in America, if they lose, then it's national disgrace. But even if they win... Well, it's only Iran, it's not much for a bit. Anyway, and I wish them joy of it, and then Milosevic to come on Thursday in the shoot-off. Larry. Um, I, I, I've got a story about... Well, it's a p news that Des Lynham is God. He's officially God now. Uh, the BBC have reported that since uh, the um, start of the World Cup, he's got 10,000 emails and fan letters, including one from a, from a girl who's asked him to be her dad. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of women who are willing to step in earlier in that process. Um, he also it says it says it says this is what which paper is India, isn't it? This is the uh, Indian. It says that uh, he's earning a hundred one million from the BBC a year. He's got a deal plus one hundred sixty thousand pounds are dead from various adverts, including that deodorant one. If you see on the TV, the really odd one. Um, his agent says he, as in Des, doesn't um, just do advertise anything. He would only consider adverts if he thinks they're the right things to do. Presumably the cheque is large enough. Peter Hitchens. I'm told there's some football competition on at the, at the moment. Is, is, is that right? You should be a judge. I'd... I'd well... <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> what do you mean lunchbox? <laughs> And, and I, I, I also saw in, again, The Observer, I'm afraid, a, a very telling comment by uh, Melanie Phillips about our problem with football in this country, which a game which makes us even more brain dead than we already were. Uh, that uh, this that uh, uh, other countries, the most popular person in <laughs> other countries uh, have football, um, but only we have trashed our culture, which could explain why we take it so seriously. But the story which caught my eye also summed this up. Even in Northern Ireland, where they're at present voting on their entire future and whether they're going to be part of the Irish Republic in 20 years or not, uh, they have become so obsessed with football that they've lost interest in their future. And it seems to say all the things about football you need to know. It, it reminds me so much of the last days of the Roman Empire and bread and circuses. I wish people would talk about something else. Well, those Romans Not just High Court judges. Those Romans are very good footballers, Peter. You've got to give it to them. Well, usually with people's heads. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like, actually it's interesting in, in, in Ireland, the Belfast Sunday Life tonight are running a story that the government is backing plans to build a 40,000 seater stadium to take a new football team into the Premiership, into the uh, English Premier League. Does that impress you? Yeah. I mean, I think oddly being not impressed by football is, uh, uh, in, at this particular moment is, is very curious for an active, all-round journalistic person well, such as yourself. It's awesome as I can't it be. If you, if you work in newspaper for any length of time, what you realise is actually at least 50% of your readership buy a newspaper to read about sport, and they're not reading you, but they're the just other, reading the back. The other 50%, of course, aren't doing that. And I, I think people should begin to wear T-shirts saying, how dare you assume I'm interested in football? I'm sure there are a lot more of us out there than are, than are admitting it. Well, well at least football is completely submerged It's only because you didn't get picked for your team at school. I got picked for it all the time. I should imagine you were a blocker, were you? Oh, you know, it's sort of defensive. <laughs> Near the goalkeeper, Peter. I'm not sure I, I, should, I should answer that with, uh, with a debate like the one well, on we've got, that we've, we've got. Well, got we've got two pieces of... Uh, last, this time last week, unfortunately, we broke the... Uh, business of the British fans writing in Marseille. We've got people now in Toulouse, and there's nothing happening in Toulouse, which is about the best news of the evening. Uh, but we have got in the Sunday People's second edition, they've changed, Scotland Yard's anti-hooligan police unit advised Prince Charles and his son, Harry, not to attend Friday's England World Cup clash with Colombia. But Harry and Prince Charles have decided to attend despite the advance, even though police fear ferocious rioting. So I think in sport, I would uh, probably put that one up, despite the war on the football pitch between America and Iran, as the story there. And back to uh, Will now. Will, Will Hutton, are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. I think the people's um, story is a pick-up, isn't it, from the Telegraph's front page. I think yeah, it's the second it's edition. So it on, I think yeah. the Telegraph should get the credit for that. I'm, I mean, I think the... I mean, I, I mean you can... The, the sports story for me, I think, is the uh, Des Lynham story. Although, f frankly, we've got a collapse of England cricket team today. We had England walloped by the New Zealanders in, uh, in, uh, in, in New Zealand, and there's been two good World Cup games. And I was quite surprised that you know, none of the sports reports came out in your, in your sports section. I would, if I was, if I was your, uh, sorry, one of your uh, panel editing a Sunday paper tomorrow, I think I'd want to tell my readers something about the major sports events of Saturday. Yes, but yes. <laughs> well, there's, there's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is they'll have heard the results, if you're talking about results, on the radio and television, won't they? I, I think there's a... I think there's a there's, so there's a difference uh, there's between... An important, there's an important service in, in uh, you know, describing what took place in New Zealand, describing the, the amazing collapse of England today and the, and the attempted fight back. I mean, these are... These are, you know, good, strong match reports are actually, I think, the bedrock of a, you know, the sports, the sports section of a, of a quality Sunday paper, you know. I, but I, do, I, do, I, do like, I do like the independent story on Des Lynham. I think it's, I think it's amazing, you know, 10,000 hits, 10,000 hits on the internet, and all that mail, and, uh, you know, the, his astonishing earnings. It was a good story. Perhaps we didn't have the most sporting of panels in the history of this program, but uh, that, <laughs> might, that might occur. Well, thank you very much, and so uh, that, uh, that concludes our board. We're going to the quirky stories for the... Uh, and um, end piece, and we'll start with uh, Francis Ween. Melvin, this is from the style section of the Sunday Times. Uh, they're inaugurating a new feature this week. All these Sunday magazines with acres to fill and nothing to put in it dream up new gimmicks. I mean, in the old days, they had a room of my own or a day in the life of. Now, the style section of the Sunday Times has started a new series, Show Us Your Pants. <laughs> <laughs> this week, Michael Winner. Michael Winner says, It is a great honour to start this important series of photographs. And he shows us a pair of his pants. Black with a sort of white trimming at the top. And it's marked underwear, presumably so he 
doesn't confuse them with his socks. Um, <laughs> and he put them the first ones out of the drawer, and there they are, photographed in the Sunday Times style section. And they're not wife fronts, as far as one can tell. But this is going to run and run, this series. You may well be in it one day. You may be invited into it, whether you want to show them or not. We'll all be in it eventually, I suppose. Well, thanks for that, Francis. Uh, it's the sort of thing you'd volunteer for, isn't it, Peter? Eh? Um, no, but here, here my story is about a, a, a man who definitely doesn't want to show us his pants. It's one of those stories you look at and you think, can this possibly be true? In the news of the world, it's about a, a tool hardener from, from Gloucester called Raymond Knowles. <laughs> You've got, to take, you've got to take us very slowly I can't, this. I, I, I take this thing very seriously. A, a and you, so we found your bedroom. This is what you take. After all these things, this is what you take. Desperate Raymond... Well, it's more interesting than football. Desperate Raymond Nobbs is, is a prisoner in his own home because he suffers from Britain's most embarrassing medical condition. Uh, you'll be able to guess what it is uh, when I tell you that he wears loose-fitting tracksuit bottoms so he doesn't find himself restricted when the condition takes him by surprise. <laughs> Apparently he's had four... Operations are unimaginably awful like to try and correct to try and correct this condition. He, he and he, he's he's very upset about all these stories about Viagra. He wants the opposite of Viagra. The best bit you've missed a bit, isn't it? Thirty-seven and a half hours was the worst. I wasn't attack I, he's had of this condition. Actually, he's, he, he timed it thirty-seven hours and fifteen minutes. Uh, and uh, fortunately, urology expert John Pryor of the Middlesex Hospital assures us. I must say, it is a very rare condition. This is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. this is the Viagra effect, isn't it? On the newspapers, yes, totally. Yes. It's a dramatic rise just, in the I amount being, of pieces about male sexual I'm not being unduly sceptical. This guy is called Raymond Nobbs. His profession, <laughs> his, profession, his profession is given as that of a tool hardener. <laughs> I know it's June, but could it be April the 1st as well? Much more yeah. believable piece in, um, I, I'm afraid I forget which, about a new novel um, about impotence. A woman wrote, wrote a book about how she'd advertised for an impotent male and found that millions of other women were also interested in attracting an impotent male because much less hassle to get someone who really kind of is interested in having a cup of tea with you and kind of <laughs> 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 I mean, unbelievable this is this is the post viagra effect before we go to our final two quirky stories i'm just going to put up our list of the day uh of the of the new day uh, our lead story was the crime rates uh, francis Wien's story the gossip was share on the jukebox the politics was brown versus blair because of and despite the observer, the lifestyle was the pet lover's story. The sport was Prince Harry defies World Cup thugs. Now then, Jane Thin. I've got a ghastly story, which is on the front page of the um, Sunday Times, about how saying, have a nice day, which is now completely compulsory in Britain, although it's apparently been abandoned in um, America, can give you cancer. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a horrible habit, and um, it's completely caught on. And according to um, somebody from Salford University, having to hide how you really feel and fake enthusiasm to customers who are rude to you can cause hypertension, coronary heart disease, and even exacerbate cancer. I believe it can be a killer. So <laughs> this, has been, this has been abandoned in America. Nobody ever wishes you a nice day. Although I hope they still say missing you already, which is my all-time favorite. Um, but uh, it's come to Britain, unfortunately. It looks like it's here to stay. Larry Turner, your tr quirky question. Uh, I mean, this quirky is story. I was going to say trivial, <laughs> but how dare I? Um, it's from the Express on Sunday. And um, it's a story about anybody who's been to Sega World, or was it Sega World? I've actually been, and I don't know how to say Anyway, computer games kind of place in the centre of London. Um, they've got this um, electric chair slot machine now. <laughs> Um, and you put your money in, and you strap your ankle. This is true. Put strap yeah. your ankle to it. Then you hold onto the, the two hand, the armrests, and they vibrate very, very. And if you, and you get kind of points if you can hang on long enough to simulate electric shocks. There's also smoke and a noise, and the smoke is meant to, and a smell which is meant to be like human flesh burning. Um, yeah. It's it's sick. It's very sick. However, oh Gavin God. Spears from Sega World says everyone here loves it. <laughs> There's nothing dangerous about the, sh the shocker, as it's called. It's just taking the Mickey, Mickey out of being electrocuted. <laughs> well, what fun. What fun. Now, we, we have a terrific choice on our hands, and it's up to you. But, uh, you can just, on this section, you can just... Do the like, which is the best? Michael Winner's underpants? Yes. No. Yes. Saying have a nice day gives you cancer? Yes. Disgrace of the electric chair story? Yes. Or Raymond Nobbs? Yeah. Yeah. No, you don't believe it, do you? The <laughs> Looks to me like the electric chair story, and uh, so uh, 
Thank you very much, Electric Chair, for bringing us that piece of cheerful news to see us into Sunday. Thank you, Laura Turner. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Jane Thing. Thank you, Francis Wayne. And Will Hutton, thank you very much for uh, talking to us about the Observer from your <laughs> eerie. I heard your laugh. There you are. I can see your laugh. Yeah, uh, well, thank you. Enjoyed it. <laughs> Good. See you soon. And uh, we're about to go, and he's counting us down, and we will be back uh, a later time next week, unfortunately. We hope we'll be back next Saturday evening. We might just make it. See you then. Good night. Sunday's next week will be at the